Good evening and welcome to Writers on Writing. I am your host, Dr. Brenda Green, and we have a special edition of Writers on Writing that is being televised with one of our authors who's come out with a wonderful book, a very riveting book, The History of Stokely. It's called Stokely A Life. Writers on Writing comes to you every week and gives you, our listening audience, an opportunity to listen to writers talk about their work, their lives, and their craft. And we have in the studio today, Peniel Joseph, Professor Peniel Joseph. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Okay, thank you so much for coming. Just to share um, with our audience a little bit about you, you are a professor of history at Tufts University and the author of not only Stokely A Life, but Waiting to the Midnight Hour, a nar narrative history of black power in America in dark days, bright nights from black power to Barack Obama, and editor of the Black Power Movement, <laughs> Rethinking the Civil Rights Black Power Era. So you are immersed in black power <laughs> politics, um, history, and Africana studies. They're calling it black power studies, I understand. Yes, yes, that's what we called it um, maybe 15 years ago. Um, it was really a call. Um, I, in the Black Scholar, I wrote, uh, I edited a two-issue um, special um, called Black Power Studies, um, and the article I wrote was called um, Toward Black Liberation Without Apology. And um, I wrote that because I really felt, in terms of reading the history of black radicalism, so everybody from Ida B. Wells, um, um, Mariah Stewart, um, so there's a long history, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, uh, we usually think about a litany of black men, but there's right. a litany of black women who are, um, and of course men who are black radicals. Some were Marxists, socialists, uh, revolutionary feminists, um, some were more liberals. But this history of radicalism um, becomes even bigger in the post-war period. And even before the post-World War II period, Marcus Garvey, uh, but Amy Jacques Garvey, and um, um, Nanny Helen Barrows, and, and all these different black women and men who were trying to transform America. And I felt that the reason I called it Black Liberation Without Apology, by the time we got to the 60s in the narratives of the history, um, black power was something people apologized for. Black power was a period where people said 20 years later, 25 years later, uh, both whites and some blacks were trying to argue that it had been a mistake, it had been too vociferous, it was too um, narrow, right? And I thought in terms of studying and reading that history and also participating in aspects of it um, in New York City, you know, um, my mom is a uh, retired um, um, hospital worker who was part of 1199 SCIU for over 40 years and um, I was on my first picket line at eight years old uh, right here in New York City. So, um, and, and was part of organizing for black studies in high school, uh, part of um, anti, uh, uh, you know, what they were doing to Haitians in terms of Haitian immigration, Haitian immigrants in Guantanamo Bay, um, anti-apartheid activism, but also anti-police brutality activism during the Koch administration okay. and the Dinkins administration, um, organized on behalf of David Dinkins in terms of trying to volunteer and do different things before he was elected uh, the first black uh, mayor of New York City in 1989. So my contention was that black power wasn't something to apologize for. Certainly it was a movement that had shortcomings and, and at times failures, but it, it was not a failure or a shortcoming to resist white supremacy, to have a criticism against capitalism, to have a criticism against violence against black women and children and men. That wasn't anything to apologize for. Well, now it's very interesting, um, just listening to you tell your story, I'm just reminded of the story of Kwame Torre and Stokely Carmichael. Yes. There's some seeds there of your own story and, and his. There's some interesting parallels. So that's a good segue into how, what motivated you to write uh, this book, Stokely, A Life. Yeah, I think what motivated me um, is really my mother and my background. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm the son of, the proud son of Haitian immigrants who came to the United States. My mom came to the United States in 1964. And um, uh, we, you know, I was born in Manhattan. Um, uh, lived in Brooklyn, 
Uh, we were in Eastern Parkway and just, you know, right okay, around. Okay, that's very, right. Very close to Medgar. You're in the Caribbean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were in the Caribbean. And then we moved to Queens when I was four or five. And um, I grew up in a household where people were talking about Haitian history, uh, African-American history, Pan-African history um, all the time and talking about social movements and also criticizing um, the conservative repudiation of those movements. I grew up where there was criticism of Ronald Reagan, there was criticism of Ed Koch, there was criticism of all these different um, officials who were basically anti-black, who were anti-human, who were anti-civil rights and social progress, anti-labor, right? Um, so that really was part of the inspiration. So I, I, I read the Black Jacobins when I was 10 years old. I read um, Malcolm X. I read about all these different people, um, these women met men, reading Asada, um, about Asada Shakur, reading about Black Panthers, um, but also reading about black women in the 19th and the early 20th century too. So it's very much immersed in a black um, political, uh, intellectual, social tradition but one that was pan-African, one that, you know, we understood who Kwame Nkrumah was. We understood about African decolonization and the so-called scramble for Africa, how Europe had cut Africa into ribbons uh, for their own self-aggrandizement. So we understood all that. And we understood that there were connections between Africa, the Caribbean, and the United States. So from that perspective, uh, finding out about Kwame Touré, Stokely Carmichael, um, really in junior high school in a deep way, who he was, why he called for black power, always made him a hugely uh, intriguing and heroic figure for me. Um, and while I was researching my first book, Waiting Till the Midnight Hour, I got deeper into Kwame Ture, um, deeper into Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., Angela Davis, um, you know, Gloria Richardson, all these different wonderful right. people, Lorraine Hansberry. And um, it really stuck with me that uh, Kwame Ture deserved a biography a historical biography. Stokely Carmichael deserved a historical biography, and that's what really inspired me to write the book. Well, it's, it's interesting that you bring up all of these names because one of the things you do in the biography is you really contextualize it um, very much in terms of giving us, it's not just a story of Stokely Carmichael, uh, it's a story of the movement. Yes. But share with us what are the highlights. If you had to Imagine you're talking to an audience who does not, does not know Kwame Ture. Yeah. What do we need to know about Kwame Ture? Why is he important in the movement? Why is it important that a, a biography be written about him? Well, Why don't our young people have Kwame Ture or Stokely Carmichael at the tip of their tongues? Well, well Stokely is really one. One of the things I argue in the book is he's one of the three um, most important figures uh, in the post-war period, post-World War II. Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, and they form this unacknowledged triumvirate. We don't know about Stokely because Stokely was a revolutionary who remained a revolutionary. And um, the highlights are, he's born in Port of Spain, Trinidad in 1941, moves to the United States um, two weeks before his 11th birthday, uh, Morris Park section of the Bronx, goes to Bronx Science High School, uh, becomes a political activist in high school, and he's radicalized by both blacks and whites. He's radicalized by the Caribbean influences. He's radicalized by Harlem. Uh, he's radicalized by his own household. But he also goes to school with white um, uh, students at Bronx Science who are the sons and daughters of very radical uh, New York and some Jewish intellectuals uh, who are part of the Communist Party, Socialist Party. So he's radicalized by all that. Bayard Rustin becomes one of his mentors, and Bayard Rustin is the leading black social democratic activist of, of the post-war period. So all those things radicalize him. By the time the sit-in movements happen, February 1st, 1960, Stokely's ready for action. He's charismatic, he's brilliant, he's handsome. Uh, women, men, everyone gravitates That's towards right. Stokely Carmichael, and he becomes an activist who's part of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, which is the most important grassroots organization of the 1960s. So Stokely is arrested for the first time June 8, 1961, in Mississippi. He's a freedom rider alongside of people like John Lewis and Ruby Doris Smith, um, um, all these different people. And the interesting part about Stokely is that he goes to Mississippi at 19, he's going to spend 49 days. In a, in, a, in a prison farm, turns 20 in jail, and dedicates his life to the movement. So between 61 and 66, he's arrested 27 times. 
Um, he's organizing in Cambridge, Maryland with Gloria Richardson. He's organizing in Washington, D.C. He meets Martin Luther King Jr. in 1963. He's one of the organizers of Malcolm X's visit to Howard University in 1961. And he's on the front row, and you can see him in Muhammad Speaks in the, the November issue of the Muhammad Speaks after Malcolm's October 30th visit to Howard University. Um, and really, one of his claims to fame is also being one of the key activists during Freedom Summer. Yes, talk Freedom about, t tell us about Freedom Summer, because we're just, we've just celebrated that. We just celebrated the 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer, and Stokely is key. There's going to be a contingent of Howard University students, 15, 18 students, who are part of Freedom Summer, who work with Stokely. Really, Stokely is the second congressional district director of the entire Mississippi Delta. So he's driving around, checking on people, um, doing door-to-door -door organizing, but checking on everything that SNCC is doing because they break up Mississippi into five congressional districts. And basically, Freedom Summer is several different things. On one level, it's a voter registration right. drive. On another level, it's an educational, revolutionary, pedagogical movement with 40 freedom schools that are set up that teach over 2,000 people with black and white teachers giving civic lessons and black folks giving African-American history lessons and African history lessons. And it's also a political organizing summer with the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party being organized by Fannie Lou Hamer and Aaron Henry. Stokely's involved in all of it. He's involved in all of it. He graduates from Howard University and goes down to uh, Mississippi. And one of the first things he does is look for the bodies of Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman, along with Charlie Cobb and others, uh, on June 22nd, uh, right. 1964. Those bodies are recovered August 4th. Those are the three civil rights workers, two white, one black, who are, who are murdered by the, the, the American authorities, right. uh, the Philadelphia police. So Stokely is up against a, a, a landscape where there is no small d democracy in Mississippi or the United States in 1964. And that's what he's organizing for. So Freedom Summer, he's one of the main architects. He goes to Atlantic City, and when Atlantic City, MFDP, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, they try to get seated at the Democratic National that Convention. That was amazing, yes. And they're betrayed, they're betrayed. So Stokely's right on the boardwalk. He's, he's convening with people like Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, they're offered two non-voting delegates. Um, they reject that. Right. And Stokely also, for the rest of his life, Kwame Touré, he rejects the Democratic Party. So he's never part of mainstream politics ever again. So what he does for, from Mississippi is go down to Alabama. And in Alabama, while Dr. King is organizing Selma, and Stokely marches March 9th, and, and in, in other demonstrations with Dr. King for Selma, but him and Judy Richardson and, and, and the late Bob Mance, what they do is they go into Lowndes County. And Lowndes County is a county of 3,000 people in Alabama. It's in the buckle of the Alabama Black Belt. It's between Selma and Montgomery. They go into Lowndes County to try to do independent political organizing, and they're gonna found a Lowndes County Freedom Organization along with local people, um, John Hewlett and others, and that freedom organization symbol is going to be the Black Panther. So Stokely's um, activism helps found the Black Panther Party, the original Panthers in Lowndes County, Alabama, and it influences the Panthers in Oakland, California, right. the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, that he's going to be honorary prime minister. So when we think about Mississippi and Alabama, it's Stokely Carmichael who's pushing for radical independent politics away from the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Okay. And, he's, and then he's going to become SNCC chairman right. in 1966, and then, of course. And then, of course, then he goes on to um, the Black Panthers. Um, one of the things that I, I, I pulled out some quotes that I, I thought, um, and, and you just talked about Mississippi as a battleground for American, um, battleground for American, um, Americans' um, freedom. But one of the things you talk about is and I, don't, I think this was a quote from him, the great contradiction of the civil rights movement was that although whites were the majority and thus accountable for making democracy work, blacks inevitably bore the burden of this responsibility. And I just wanted you to, to elaborate on that because part of there's, there's been uh, some back and forth in terms of, of Stokely Carmichael or Kwame Touré actually SNCC initially being interracial, and then he ends up going through the Pan-Africanism, um, Pan-Africanist movement, and really does not want to, to work with blacks. 
with whites. With whites, yeah. With whites. Well, you know, the, the interesting part, what he's saying there is basically, or, or I might be paraphrasing what he said, is the idea that when we think about America and small d democracy, um, whites have been in political control of the country and they've basically distorted that democracy um, um, in, in favor of racial and economic exploitation. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, black people have been the leaders and been those at the cutting edge of a real expanse of democracy. And that's a great, great contradiction. So it's black people, black women and men who have been the leading folks for not just civil rights, but human rights and um, public school education, health care, all these things for everyone, even while the majority of the population is more interested in exploitation and really racial terror against black people. So those, that's one of the interesting things. I think Stokely's political philosophy is going to evolve. I mean, he calls for black power starting June 16, 1966, um, and he's calling for radical political self-determination becomes the biggest anti-war activist yes. uh, in the United States of America, and we can talk about that deeply. But his critique of whites is going to be a complicated critique. One of the things I say is that Sokoli Carmichael Kwame Ture was never a conventional racial separatist, even though all the distortions keep saying he was. Because even okay. once he becomes Kwame Ture, I've interviewed and I've met white activists who had worked with him. Uh, Kwame Ture is hugging them and their kids yes. and their children. So he, Kwame Ture was a humanist. Here's what he says. He's got a critique of liberal racism, which is still with us in the United States today. He's got a critique of liberal condescension and, and the, pa the, the, the patronizing of black people. What he says is that whites need to go and organize and, and try to challenge white supremacy. Stokely Carmichael does not throw whites out of SNCC. He disagreed with that decision. SNCC does so in December of 1966. 19 to 18, they refused to let um, Bob Zellner and the last remaining folks in SNCC carry out a project under the name of SNCC in New Orleans. He disagrees with that because Stokely, one of Stokely's uh, best uh, colleagues, Jonathan Daniels, white, white um, seminary student, was killed in Alabama by, by white folks in 1965. Because that's who was killing black people and white people is white people, right? And so the interesting part about Stokely is that even as SNCC turns to black power, he never is trying to demonize whites. He's demonizing white supremacy. And in fact, one of his main supporters is uh, who I talk about in the book, um, um, Lorna, Lorna Smith yes, is a white, elderly, elderly white. white woman who loves Stokely even with the turn to black power because she realizes what he's saying. He's saying these institutions have to change and transform and one of the things he does, he is so increasingly radical and by really 66, 67 becomes really a full-blown revolutionary because he starts to look at systems. He goes to Puerto Rico, he goes to Cuba, and again, what one big speech that he does, October of 1966 at Berkeley, is really one of the best speeches anybody um, has ever given uh, in the black freedom movement, where he talks about white privilege. He talks about white supremacy. He talks about the fact that the war in Vietnam is an imperial war, all of which he was right. He's daring to speak unspeakable and unspoken truths that Dr. King's not going to speak about until April of 67. And that's why Stokely is being investigated by the CIA, right. by the FBI, by the State Department, by Lyndon Johnson in the White House, and a whole range of local authorities. So Stokely is the person who, who bridges civil rights and black power, and certainly SNCC is very important here, and SNCC had come out against the Vietnam War in a statement in January of 1966, but it's Stokely Carmichael who provides a template for what the Black Panthers are going to do. He provides a template for SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society. He provides a, a template for the revolutionary anti-imperialism, revolutionary pan-Africanism that we're going to see people like Amiri Baraka and others take in their own directions. But without Stokely Carmichael, and also on top of it, he's the person who, 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 who advocates black is beautiful in a way uh, that is, is panoramic before James Brown That's comes right. around well, in 68. I'm, sure I'm sure James Brown um, heard that. One of the things, and I, I, I don't want us to run out of time, but another um, point, and you've, you've touched on that, that when he left the United States, I think you say he left the United States a radical political activist but returned a revolutionary. Yes. I mean, and, and, and what did going outside of the United States do for him, do for more, I guess, do more for other people? 
and in, other movements. Absolutely. It enlarged his scope. He really saw revolutionaries and met with revolutionaries. He goes to London. He meets up with C.L.R. James um, and, and, and Mike Lex and others. Um, he goes to Cuba and he's with Fidel Castro in the Sierra Maestra. He's in Santiago de Cuba. Um, he's seeing how revolutionaries live and work and operate. He goes to Vietnam and he meets up with Ho Chi Minh. He meets up with the legendary Shirley Graham Du Bois, du Bo W. E. B. Du Bois' widow in China and, and, and Africa. Um, he goes to Algiers and meets up with revolutionary government and officials in Algiers. And of course, he goes to Conakry, Guinea, and Tanzania. And in Conakry, he meets up with not only Kwame Nkrumah and Sekou Toure, but and Kwame Nkrumah is, is, is the father of post-war Pan-Africanism. Right. And Sekou Toure is the leader, the president of Guinea. He also meets up with Amilcar Cabral and the people who are part of the PAIGC and the revolutionary movements in Cape Verde and Guinea-Bissau. So, He's meeting up in Tanzania and Jomo Kenyatta. He's meeting all these revolutionaries, and he's seeing that the United States is not necessarily the headquarters of the world. That's what he comes back with. And he comes back with that at a time where people aren't really um, on to what Stokely is on to. You know, Malcolm had been on to it, that there was this whole other world of anti-colonialism, pan-Africanism, and a whole other way of life where the United States was not central where the center right. was Africa. Africa wasn't the periphery, right? And so the so-called third world, the third world was the center. So he comes back knowing that and trying to galvanize both the Black Panthers, the Black United Front, folks in SNCC to, to understand that, one, we have to make these alliances, but we can also headquarter ourselves other places than the United States. Okay. Now you want to... Um you're, you're obviously a, a, a wordsmith. You did a lot of research. Um, I just found it kind of interesting uh, that uh, two of the titles you chose, um, one, The Chocolate Fred Astaire, <laughs> and the other, Magnificent Barbarian. I mean, I, I can look in the book and see why you chose that, but I just found it very interesting because <coughs> you would, you would, you very, I know you were very deliberate about what you did. Can you talk a little bit about that, why you chose to highlight um, him in that way. Yeah, the chocolate Fred Astaire is something that he, that's a quote from Kwame Touré when he's writing his autobiography, Ready for Revolution. Right. And he's, he's describing how white liberals and white folks at Bronx Science viewed Feel him, him. Viewed him as the chocolate Fred Astaire. And I wanted to set that up because I think people look at Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Touré is sort of this angry black man, right? This angry sort of one-dimensional okay. sort of stereotypical black man. And I wanted to show w the, the complicated sort of matrix and ma matrices that actually produced him, where this wasn't somebody who hated white people, even as he was talking about black power. He's actually this revolutionary humanist, and he actually uh, didn't hate white people. He wasn't anti-Semitic. He was this humanist, right? Um, he's got a critique against white supremacy. Um, he's for Palestinian liberation. He's for these different things. But, but what I wanted to show is that there's a certain point in his life where um, um, whites love Stokely Carmichael. You know, they invited him to their homes in the Upper East and Upper West Side. Right. You know, that he, he was one of the few black kids at Bronx Science High School, but he was really the most popular student in the class of 1960. Right. So I just wanted to emphasize that and what that does to somebody and how... He, he, he has a very, very complicated background because it's a very pro-black background. It's a very Caribbean and Pan-Africanist background, but it's a very intimate relationship with whites as well. And the white community and white culture were part of what formed him intellectually, right? So by the time he is, is talking about black power, he really understands Marxist critiques and historical materialism. He's been reading that stuff since he was a teenager. Right, so I wanted to show that, and and the the, the title, the magnificent barbarian, is from an ebony um, profile right. of him um, by L Lerone Bennett, and and the interesting part there was that you know there's you know uh, SNCC people are being interviewed, and some people said that Stokely looks like the, the a statue of a Nubian god. Um, they said you know all these things, but then that 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 whole notion of the magnificent barbarian in the sense of Stokely was obviously very cultured, very intellectual, very sophisticated and cosmopolitan, but he's also somebody who's hugely passionate. He's usually passionate and he, he is also an enemy of injustice. So what Stokely did 
Um, and obviously Malcolm X did this and Dr. King did this and so many different um, black women and men did this. He's very passionate about black people and he loves black people. He's always talking about an undying love for black people. So I, the Magnificent Barbarian, I, I like that in the sense that um, this, this notion that this is somebody who will not be um, tamed. And this is somebody, sometimes you do have to um, shout. And that's what the black arts movement said. Sometimes you had to curse. Sometimes you had to name names. And that's what Sonia Sanchez has done, right. Nikki Giovanni, where it's not going to be polite. And so when Stokely Carmichael says all the courthouses in Mississippi have to be burnt down to the ground to get rid of the dirt, one, I don't think that's hyperbolic. hyperbolic. And he, he was right. He was, he was talking about in, uh, these institutions of white supremacy that were killing black Americans, right, um, right. with impunity, right, a criminal justice system. So he was willing to say things that other people wouldn't say, and he was also willing to do things like he's not going to meet with the president of the United States. That's right. SNCC, could, SNCC invited to the Civil Rights Con Conference, you know, um, he's, he's not going, you know, he, he's not interested in the niceties. I, I appreciate that. I think we need people who are political leaders and activists at times who aren't interested in niceties. And of course, Stokely was very, very smart and very, very intelligent. But he's also somebody who's willing to speak truth to power, even if it means he's going to have enemies and not going to have standing ovations. Okay. I'm glad you, thank you for, for, for saying that. Because, you know, there's this, all these connotations. And, and not everyone um, who reads this reads as critically yeah. and gets that perspective. Um, in your research process, what, what was the highlight? What was your research process like? Yeah, it was extensive. I mean, it was really going to... How many years? It, it took 10 years, and I ended up okay. going to 55 different archives in wow. the United States, London, Paris, Stockholm. Did not go to Africa because as Africa, uh, archives are not open to the public. They're not open to, and I tried, so they're not open to researchers as of yet. I hope that happens. His papers were supposed to go to Howard University. That did not happen. Where are his papers? Um, they are scattered. They are scattered as far as I know. Um, so there was a ton of um, archival sources, whether it's the Schomburg here in New York City or Stanford University in California, um, different newspaper sources, different government documents, FBI files. Uh, different oral histories that I made, that I conducted, and some that I sourced. Um, his own autobiography, is, which is which is obviously a brilliant um, documentation and memoir. So it was a, it was it was definitely a far you know um, old footage and videos and documentaries. So it was definitely a far reaching, and then you know a ton of secondary uh, literature. You, you interviewed um, a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, okay. yeah. Okay, yeah. and what was the highlight for you in terms of that research? I mean, some some moments that you that really were um, riveting, or even if you don't want to say highlight, what was I think yeah. I think the anti-war activism was one of the highlights, mm -hmm. and the fact that it, Stokely was, was the leader and King was the follower in this issue, in this instance, um, and they both knew it. Um, their relationship was also a highlight. You know, Stokely and King, I think, loved each other. Yeah, um, and, and we don't they, know that. The public exactly. does not yeah, know that. And I think they mentored each other. And um, that was a very, very important um, relationship, uh, I think. Um, also, his influence on the, the Black Panthers and the larger anti-imperial struggle was a highlight. And really, the trips over, overseas, you know, Cuba, um, Africa, uh, you know, Paris, London, um, Stockholm, um, you, know, you know, China, Vietnam were, were highlights. Okay. So in closing, yeah. why do we need to know about Stokely Carmichael, <laughs> Kwame Torre? Well, let's say Kwame Torre. Well, Kwame, Kwame Torre was a revolutionary pan-Africanist, civil rights activist uh, who really transformed the black freedom struggle. We need to know him now more than ever because the things that he was fighting for, which were human rights and social justice, uh, are actually more distant in our own time than they were in his. Um, he criticizes American racism, um, capitalism, uh, racial and economic exploitation. And we need to know this, what that legacy is and was and continues to be. Um, he, he believes in a global Pan-African revolution. Um, he believes in social and political justice and human rights and equal rights for, for all. And so we, we need to understand that the reason why so many young black people don't know who Kwame Touré is is because he's somebody you can't rehabilitate. You can't rehabilitate a revolutionary, so what you do is try to erase a revolutionary. That's right. 
So thank you. Thank you for doing the research. Thank you for telling the story. And um, thank you for bringing him alive oh, thank for you. us, for young people. Um, I, I, I thought about the freedom schools and how we need more freedom schools. They should be. Oh, absolutely. They should absolutely. be happening. And we need a new voting rights movement right now. We certainly do. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much well, for coming to Megar Evers College. <laughs> oh, thank you, Dr. Green. Okay, yeah. and um, please, um, I want to tell the listening audience to go out and get Stokely a Life, a very, very important book. Um, Professor Peniel Joseph is the author. He's done a magnificent job. It's a critical work. It's something that you can go back to. Um, you can do a read, and it's, it's wonderful research, excellent research. Thank you. This has been Dr. Brenda Green, the host of Writers on Writing. This next song was inspired by a poem written by Langston Hughes. I'm sure most of you have heard of Langston Hughes. And he wrote a poem about rivers. <laughs>